Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who's registered to uh, watch the Recent Advances in Animal Welfare Science Conference. We're not going to start straight away because we're still expecting some more people to uh, click the link and join us. But uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope that the quality is good and uh, I hope you enjoy what should be an interesting two days of meeting. If you're looking for something to do while you're waiting, um, you have the drop down menu box on the side. Uh, there, are, there are some handouts there you can look at or you can download. And it's also using that menu box that you can ask questions of the speakers, um, which I will then read out and share with them. But you are all muted and you will remain muted for the duration of the conference. Other thing you need to be aware of too is that you should have uh, to watch other sessions apart from this session one, you need to find the email that says you're registered for session two or registered for session three, which you have to do individually, and then click the join webinar button in that email. So I'm just going to wait for another minute or so to allow more people to join and then we'll begin. So hello everybody and welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Stephen Wickens and this is the U4 meeting Recent Advances in Animal Welfare Science set, our first ever virtual conference. This is the first of five sessions we'll be broadcasting over the next two days. The sessions are being recorded, but to watch each of these sessions live, you need to have registered for each using the link we have previously shared with you via email and the recordings of each of the sessions will be available on uh, the web within 24 hours. The conference features live talks from a great range of speakers and you can ask them questions using the chat or question tab in the meeting drop down menu. We also have an extensive range of diverse, exciting, and innovative science presented in the conference's posters too. And to access these, please download the poster handout in the drop down menu and click on the relevant links. And if you wish to ask the poster presenters any questions, please contact them directly using the email shown in the abstract booklet. This is one of a range of other handouts you can access via the drop down menu, including uh, a flyer for money off books and a certificate of attendance for the conference that I know some of you asked about. You can download these, but you need to download them before any session ends. As I said, this is the first of such meetings we've run online, and we've learned a lot and I'm sure we'll learn a lot more. We hope you bear with us if there are any technical issues. So um, I'd now like you to uh, listen to U4's Chief Executive and Scientific Director, Dr. Hugh Gollidge, who'd like to formally welcome you to the conference. So sit back with the drink of your choice and enjoy what we think will be an entertaining and stimulating conference. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name's Hugh Gollidge, I'm Chief Executive of U4 and I'd like to welcome you to our Virtual Animal Welfare Science Conference. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you all joining us today. This isn't quite the way I was expecting to welcome you to this meeting because when we originally planned meeting. it we intended to hold a face-to-face -face meeting in Birmingham in the UK. But as you know the world has changed rather dramatically over the past few months so first of all, I'd like to say that I hope very much that all of you and your friends and family and colleagues are safe and well and not too badly affected by the pandemic. Secondly, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our staff at U4 for tirelessly working to bring this meeting online and also to the speakers and poster presenters for adapting their presentations to an online meeting. 
So thank you all for enabling this meeting to be held despite uh, the recent challenges. If there is one upside to having your meeting disrupted by a global pandemic, it's that bringing the meeting online has enabled us to reach a much larger audience uh, and a much more diverse audience from much further afield than we would have done with a face-to-face -face meeting. So welcome especially to those of you who've joined us for the first time and joined us from far afield. Because we've got so many new people joining us, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about U4 and what we do and how we might actually help you in your animal welfare activities. So U4 is a charity that was founded in 1926 and our tagline is Science in the Service of Animal Welfare. And I think that really nicely describes what we do. We try to use science to better understand the welfare of animals around the world and ideally to improve their welfare. We have a number, number of, ways of ways of doing, doing that, that that I'd like I'd to like talk to you about. about. First, First of all, we fund, we fund scientific activities, activities including scientific, scientific research, research, scientific, scientific meetings, meetings, travel, travel to, to attend meetings or to undertake scientific activities, activities around the world. world. And, if and if you're interested, interested in applying for some of that funding, funding please, please do visit the grants pages on our website where you can see how you might go about applying for support from us. Uh, another, another thing we thing do is we try and, and undertake, undertake outreach, outreach activities to promote animal welfare science at universities, universities around the world. And we do, and we this, do this chiefly through, through our link scheme, scheme where we have people, people at universities uh, worldwide, worldwide who promote, promote animal, animal welfare, welfare science and promote U4 at their at the university. university. Um, if you're at a university which is active in animal welfare science through research or teaching and doesn't yet have a link with U4, please do have a look at the website and consider applying to become a link. We're particularly keen to grow the scheme around the world and in places where there's traditionally been less capacity in animal welfare science. Finally, we have a program to disseminate animal welfare science through our journal, Animal Welfare, and through a series of books which we publish. The journal, Animal Welfare, accepts submissions of, of uh, primary research and also reviews and other submissions and if you're interested in submitting some of your work to animal welfare please again have a look at the website to see how you go about doing that. Our book series is a wonderful series of animal welfare books which are fantastic resources for animal welfare science. I know it's where I went to, to learn about the field when I became interested in animal welfare and lots of other people do too. As part of this conference, we've negotiated a discount with our publishers, Wiley Blackwell. So if you use the code which is on your screen or also on the leaflet, which is in your GoToWebinar documents folder, you can have a 20% discount off any of the books in the series. So please do take advantage of that if you're interested. That's just a very quick overview of some of the main things that U4 does. We're also very active in promoting evidence-based changes in animal welfare policy and guidelines around the world. And we do all sorts of other things to promote animal welfare science. If any of our activities are useful to you or you'd like to stay engaged with what we do, please do consider becoming a member of U4. It supports what we do. It allows you to stay in touch with what we do and as a special uh, extra inducement, we also give you an even larger discount from the uh, uh, U4 Animal Welfare book series. So you can have a 35% discount if you become a member of U4. So please do consider supporting us by becoming a member. And I should say that that is how the vast majority of our activity is supported, either through our members or through members of the public donating to support our work. Despite the name, we don't receive any support from universities or other bodies. Uh, it's, it's our members and members of the public who support what we do, who enable us to keep doing what we do. So please do consider also donating to help our work if you haven't already. I know a large number of people who registered for this meeting have donated to support the meeting and other activities of U4. And I'm, I'm really grateful for your support in doing that. We couldn't do things like running this meeting 
without your support and we very much hope that your support will enable us to keep doing more of these meetings and spreading the word about animal welfare science um, around the world. So thank you very much. That's all I've got to say really, apart from that I really hope you enjoy the rest of this meeting and that uh, it provides a welcome break from everything else that's going on in the world. Please do uh, enjoy the talks, ask questions. You can ask questions through the chat box on your GoToWebinar screen uh, because I'm aware that a very important part of these meetings is engaging with the speakers and asking them questions. We'll do our very best to convey the questions to the speakers and get answers to you. Uh, the speakers will all be joining us live after their talks, so hopefully that will go really well. Also, please do follow us on Twitter and follow the conference hashtag on Twitter and feel free to tweet about uh, the talks um, as you follow the conference. Um, have a wonderful couple of days. Let us know what you think of the event um, and um, I will see you again very soon. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, you, um, for that introduction. Um, I understand there were a few people who had some sound issues, um, and we'll, we'll, uh, it, it, hopefully they won't occur again. There, there might have been a slight delay, but I'm sure that um, for most of the messages coming through, people said that that was okay. So, um, but if there is anything, just, uh, send me a question and we'll, we'll look to answer it. But um, as I said, uh, these things will get ironed out as they go along. So um, we now move to the formal part of the meeting with the first talk. And the first person who is speaking is Cathy Dwyer from the Scottish Rural College. And she's going to talk on assessing the welfare impacts of disease, an example with sheep scab. If you have any questions for Cathy during the presentation, um, please put them in the chat box and she will then be available to answer these uh, post uh, the presentation for about um, five to ten minutes. Good morning everybody and I am delighted to be kicking things off by telling you something about some of the work that uh, Stu Burgess from the Morden Institute and I have been doing looking at assessing um, the welfare impact of disease. And for this, we've used an example uh, of a sheep disease called sheep scab. So I think we'll all agree that disease or the avoidance of disease is an important part of animal welfare. And animal health and disease is integrated into all the characterizations of animal welfare. So if you think about the five freedoms, um, the five domains and so on, then it's almost implicit that uh, we will consider animal health. So we might be concerned about the health aspects of animal welfare because of the animal's feelings. So animals that are sick feel bad. They are, show sickness behavior. There might be pain and discomfort. We might also be concerned because of the biological functioning arguments. So animals that are sick grow less well, reproduce less well and have higher mortality. And often it's this second part of our concern for, for the aspects of health in animal welfare that is most prevalent in farm animals. So does this actually matter? If we only focus on the biological functioning or the production aspects of, of disease for farmed animals, does that really matter for the animal? So from the animal's point of view, as long as it receives treatment, it's probably not that concerned about our motivation in providing that treatment. However, we think that there are a number of areas where not focusing on the animal's experience may be important for the welfare of those animals. The first of these is if we only focus on treating from an economic point of view, so we're focused on the production losses that might occur if the animal is diseased, then for diseases without a production impact, we may not feel it's necessary to treat the animal from a welfare point of view. Or treatment might be delayed. We might wait until we've reached a certain economic level before an animal is treated, before there's a, a, a loss, or a certain number of animals are sick before treatment is applied. If we think only about the production costs of the disease, then again, we may, in our treatment regimes, we may focus only on dealing with the cause of the disease. 
but not also the symptoms. So you can think that for an infectious disease, we may think only about killing the bacterium or dealing with the bacterium that's caused the infection, but not necessarily thinking about the pain and discomfort associated with that and whether we should also be applying treatment to deal with that. And also we may only focus on the presence or the absence of the disease. And we can see this in a lot of welfare assessment protocols where we may look at, does the animal have a lesion or not? Does it have an alteration in gait or not? And this doesn't necessarily capture the severity of the disease in terms of the animal's experience, rather than just counting up perhaps the number of animals that may have a disease. So the aims of this study were really to try and unpack some of these things a little bit more and to understand what might be the impact of disease and indeed its treatment on animal welfare. And in carrying out this work, we've used a disease model of sheep scab. So sheep scab is an um, endemic disease in the UK of sheep. And by working with the Morden, we were able to use a controlled situation where these animals were deliberately infested with a known quantity of mites on a known day as part of vaccine development trials. So we could make use of the fact that, um, that we had a lot of information about the start and the end points of disease as part of other studies to try and find a cure for this disease or a way of eradicating the disease. So sheep scab is caused by the sheep scab mite. Seroptis ovis. This is an ectoparasite that lives on the skin of the sheep. When the animal is infested, it causes an allergic reaction through the release of specific antigens. This causes the release of a serous exudate, which the mites then feed on. So the clinical signs of this disease are intense itching and scratching and rubbing. And over time, if the disease is not treated, the animals show large areas of wool loss and a thickening or changes in the skin. Uh, in relation to the presence of the mites. So when the disease is present clinically, we can see marked alterations in the sheep behavior. So scratching and rubbing, biting. You see these stereotypic mouth and head movements as the animal tries to deal with the intense itchiness of having the presence of the mites. At the microscopic level, we can see mites on the skin surface um, and they're causing this allergic response. So once a sheep becomes infested with the scab mites, it can take several weeks before these clinical signs appear. Uh, but during that time, the animals are highly infectious. And this means that the disease can be spread rapidly during the subclinical period when animals have a few mites and then they rub against posts or rub against each other and pass that on from one animal to the next. And typically at the point where the farmer might see loss of wool or very marked alterations in behavior, up to 60% of the flock may have become infested. And so this is a quite a significant welfare challenge to treat the flock in a timely manner before the disease becomes so prevalent across the flock. So our objectives in carrying out this work was to understand or to, to identify early behavioral indicators of the presence of scab, which could be used in, a, in an on-farm setting to identify the presence of scab earlier than is currently available, but also to help us understand what it meant for the animal to be infested with scab. And also to look at some of the treatment options, whether we could deal with the intensive itchiness as well as, as treatment to kill the mites on the skin surface. So to do this, we carried out two studies. The first of these was a pilot study on eight sheep in two replicates. And this lasted for nine weeks. So we had an initial three week baseline period. Then the animals were deliberately infested with a known dose of mites on the withers. Um, and we observed the behavior for three weeks. And then half the flock were treated and we observed them for another three weeks. And so we looked predominantly at changes in behavior both before and during the infestation and then after the treatment to kill the mites. And that took the form of six hours of focal observation for each sheep per week. And our aim was to identify early behavioral indicators of the presence of mites. In the second study was a larger study. We had 30 sheep and they were split into three groups. So the first group were infested and we looked at that, uh, the, progress of the progression of the disease over six to seven weeks. The second group were, also, were infested and treated with Dectamax, which kills the mites at three weeks. And the third group were infested, 
treated with Dectamax at three weeks, but were also treated with Metacam, an anti-inflammatory drug, to try and deal also with the symptoms of the inflammatory response um, to the presence of mites or the antigens. The animals were measured weekly for the presence or for the size of the lesions caused um, on the skin surface. And we took blood samples once a week to carry out an ELISA uh, for the presence of antibodies to the, the mite antigens. And we assessed behavior intensively over a five day period just before on the day of treatment and for um, over three days after treatment. And there we took two hours of focal observations per sheep per day. So just to express that on a timeline, the animals were deliberately infested um, in week zero, treated either with, dec with Dectamax and then either with or without Metacam on week three, and the study ended at week seven. So in each of those weeks, we were assessing lesions and collecting blood samples for serology, and then we had five days behavioral observation uh, in week three around the treatment period. So to look at the results from the first study, so this was to determine early behavioural indicators of infestation. In this slide, we show the changes in animal posture. So standing in blue, lying with the head up in red, and lying with the head down in green as the disease progressed. So we summarised the baseline data the first three weeks uh, together in the, the first bar on the left. And then the data is shown per week as the disease progresses. And the data splits from week seven, eight, and nine to those animals that were not treated and to those animals that were. And what we show is that as the disease progresses, so the later stages, weeks eight and nine of infestation, the sheep are spending much more time lying with the head down, which might be indicative of a poorer quality of life or a, an explanation of the impact that the infestation was having on them. In common with other studies, we didn't show an increase in the total amount of time spent lying, but we did show an increased frequency of postural changes. So the animals are having to interrupt their behavior, uh, their, their eating or their maintenance behavior to engage in rubbing, itching and scratching. And when we looked at those behaviors of irritation, so the rubbing, biting, scratching and head rolling, so this sort of movement of the head backwards to try and reach the itch, we can see that that increased week on week after infestation, so from week four up until week nine, and then decreased when the animals were treated. And we saw that when the animals were infested, even in the first week after infestation, we saw scratching and head rolling had significantly increased over the baseline. And in addition, we also saw that these behaviors, the biting, scratching and head rolling were still present in the first week after treatment before they declined to baseline levels. So these were good indicators of the presence of infestation, but also showed that this was already having an impact on the animal on the, the first day at the first week after infestation. So the outcome of the second studies was to look at the effects of both killing the mites, but also treating the itchiness. So this data shows the amount of irritation in those five days around treatment. Uh, so the gray line is the control animals that weren't treated. The blue line is the animals where the mites were killed with Dectamax. And the red line is the animals that were both had the mites killed and also were treated with an anti-inflammatory. So on the day before treatment, day minus one, there was no difference between the two, the three groups. And you can see that the animals are really having to break up their behavior uh, very frequently. So pretty much every two minutes, they're, having, they're showing about of rubbing, biting or scratching responses. Uh, so it's having quite a big impact on, on how they respond at three weeks after infestation. However, when they were treated, we saw a significant fall in the amount of this behavior in both the groups where the mites were killed, but the fall was greatest in the group that was treated with Dectamax and Metacam. And so for the first two days of treatment, we saw a reduction, a significant reduction below that of just killing the mites uh, by also giving the anti-inflammatory until day three when the level of rubbing, biting and scratching had fallen to a, con to a low level in both groups where the mites were killed in comparison to the untreated control group. If we look at the size of lesions, we can see this is, again, there's a significant effect of time. So at week one, there's very little formation of the lesion, uh, but the lesions continue to grow in size um, and area up until week five. 
and we didn't see a significant effect of treatment on the size of the lesion. So although the mites were killed, there's still antigen presence and the lesion continues to grow until it starts to resolve later. In addition, we didn't see any significant correlation with any of our behavioral measures and the size of the lesion. So there's quite a lot of variation in behavior between different animals, and that was not related to the size of the lesion caused by the mites. These data show the change in the serology. So this was the ELISA for antibodies against the antigens produced by the mite. And we could show that the, the, the antibodies increased uh, up until about week four, and then it started to decrease in those groups that had been treated with Dectamax to kill the mites. So we, saw, we showed significant effects of time and treatment on the change in antibodies. And we also found a correlation between the serology, the antibody level, and the lesion size at week three. So animals with larger lesions tended to have higher antibodies. However, we didn't see any correlation between the presence of antibodies or the quantity of antibodies in the serum and the behavioral responses of the sheep. So when we thought about these data in terms of the issues that we had raised at the very beginning, if we thought about the economic costs of treatment and dealing with the disease. So studies that have looked at this have focused really on the cost of eradication. So although there is some production cost through the loss of wool and occasionally animals may die that have been infested with the um, with sheep scab mite, most of the costs and the thinking, the monetary costs are focused on getting rid of the disease altogether. So these have not focused on quite significant welfare costs that we were showing in this study where even from the first week of infestation there's a significant amount of time spent rubbing, biting and scratching. The animals have disturbed rest and they're spending increasing amounts of time lying with their head down which might be an indicator of depressed response. So our second concern was that by only focusing on the production or the biological functioning arguments that treatment may also focus only on the cause of disease but not on the symptoms. So in our first study, we showed that rubbing and biting continued even after the disease had been treated to kill the mite. So it hadn't immediately dealt with the welfare consequences of the disease. And in our second study, we showed that we could see increased welfare benefit by treating the inflammatory response with Metacam, as well as killing the mites. In terms of the third area where we might just focus on the presence or absence of disease and not the animal's experience. In our second study, we showed that there was no association between the clinical presence of the lesions or indeed the antibodies in the, the serum from these sheep um, and the behaviours indicative of irritation or the behaviours that might be indicative of the animal's experience. So the presence or absence or the size of the lesions was not informative of the animal's experience. So to conclude, we've shown that disease can have a significant welfare impact even in the early stages of development, so potentially in the preclinical stages, if we focus on behaviours that are indicative of the animal's experience. So just by measuring the clinical presence of disease, we may not be fully capturing all the welfare impacts. In addition, when we treat just the causes of disease, it may be that we still leave welfare impacts unaddressed, at least in the short term. And so we may need to think about our treatment regimes by focusing on the animal's experience to understand whether we need to improve treatment to also deal with welfare issues. So in summary, we believe that we are potentially underestimating the welfare impact of disease, particularly where we focus only on the clinical presence of disease, or whether we assess welfare by looking at the presence or absence of disease and not considering the severity or the impact on the animal. So I'd just like to conclude by acknowledging the funding from the Scottish Government and thanking a number of different people who were involved in technical assistance and had to deal with the, the sort of constant itchiness uh, that looking at videos of sheep scratching induced and also to thank Katie Monteith who was also part of this project as part of her MSc. Thank you. Uh, sound for some of you. I apologise for that. Um, I've posted some solutions that people have found. They're talking about uh, use of headphones 
or changing the audio setting on your computer. So if you can't hear the videos, can I suggest that you look at that? Um, but the major feedback we had is that it sounds fine. Um, so we've now got a little while uh, for Kathy to answer some questions. Um, so the first one um, we're, uh, we're going to ask her is uh, the following from Simon Kirk. If the issue is allergic reaction to this parasite, how would an injection help? Wouldn't you need a better understanding of the sheep's allergic reaction to create this? So we usually, it is an allergic reaction and we would tackle this in two ways. So the normal treatment option is just to kill the mites. Gradually the amount of antigen, which is the allergen, uh, would disappear and therefore the animal would stop uh, showing that um, allergic response. The alternative is, and again, I think if anyone's had, so this is a, a, um, a contact dermatitis sort of response. So if anyone's had eczema or been around people with eczema or has had a contact dermatitis themselves, you'll know that one of the ways, I mean, I have this, so one of the ways I would treat it is to either use an, an anti-inflammatory, which damps down the immune response, or we could use something like um, a sort of corticosterone-based treatment, which again, damps down the immune response. So what we're looking at here in the allergic response is an overactivation of immune uh, responses by the animal. And but what we, and this, this is sort of a proof of concept study, if you like. So we wanted to look at if we not only killed the mites, but we also tried to turn that immune response down to reduce the allergic itchiness response, um, which is what we managed to do with our Metacam study. Um, that was a way of sort of dialing us down, if you like, so we could reduce the amount of allergic reaction. Um, and so there have been a, a so what, what you probably couldn't really see in there, and I didn't put the um, the error bars in because they are quite large, is that within a group of animals, you get quite a marked variation in the amount of allergic response that the animals show, the amount of behavioral response the animals show. Um, and it didn't appear to be, as we showed, didn't relate to the response to the antibody response to the antigens, and it didn't respond to, it didn't relate to the size of the lesions. Um, and so there's been a number of studies that have tried to look also at the, the immune response of the sheep to look at what might be happening there. Why do some animals respond much more so than others? Which might be another way of trying to get into that um, understanding of what the allergic response is and how we might be able to deal with that. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question, um, which was an uh, interesting study. I noticed the focal watches for behavior were quite long. Well done, Kathy. Are such detailed observations needed for an effective early warning system, or could there, or could there be um, a more practical option on the ground? And that's from Claire Andrews. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we were interested. In, so when we when we did our first study, we weren't we were looking at um, animals almost the day after they've been infested. So the first time that they've had mites on the skin, which isn't really the situation that would happen in a normal natural infestation. So we weren't sure how quickly the animals would start to show this um, behavioral response, which is why we did have quite long observation periods. Um, I think the, the difficulty is that, yes, you when you look at them for that amount of time, you certainly see these, these behavioural changes occurring quite early. Um, but we were dosing these animals on a known day, so we knew exactly when the, the mites were on the skin. Um, I think when you, when you got to sort of three weeks into the infestation, we were seeing animals having to break up their behaviour probably, uh, you know, every couple of minutes they were rubbing and scratching, which is much, much greater than you would see in a normal flock. Um, and we also noticed this sort of stereotypic head rolling back moments, which other people haven't um, reported before. So these are, and these are unusual behaviors. So rubbing and scratching is a normal part of the behavioral repertoire. It's the increase in frequency um, that, that would be indicative of, of the scab infestation. So I think one of the things that we're interested to look at is, um, and it's much more difficult, obviously, in a natural infestation situation to see whether that head movement, which we saw very early in the infestation, so the day after the animals had been infested, we started to see this, this head motion, and whether that's something that could be uh, used as a, a, an earlier behavioural indicator. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cathy. Looking at the time, um, we need to move on to the next speaker. Um, other questions that have been asked will be shared with Cathy after the meeting, and uh, she'll look to try and get some responses to those as well. So. Thank you, Cathy. Um, and we are now going to move on to um, 
the next talk, the next video, um, which is um, by uh, Abigail Liston, and she's going to be talking on the wealth uh, from the University of Surrey. And she's going to be talking on the welfare study using the animal welfare assessment grid to measure quality of life of breeding and experimental rhesus macaques. Hello, and welcome to my talk on the Animal Welfare Assessment Grid, which I will refer to as AWAG for the remainder of this talk, and how I used it to quantify the impact of introducing novel enrichment on four breeding groups of rhesus macaques at the Centre for Macaques in Salisbury. I want to begin by explaining why the AWAG is a useful tool. Welfare is notoriously difficult to measure, and often cannot be scored with the same parameters for different species or environments. And for those who do not have a voice, require more robust measurement than those who can more easily make their views known. So it is of utmost importance that the welfare of non-human primates used in research is maintained to the best of our understanding. In many cases, there are no gold standards for measuring the welfare of captive animals. So researchers look used validation strategies established by clinical and experimental psychologists to provide evidence for content and construct validity. A tool that is both specific and objective is necessary to accurately assess, track and compare welfare. There has been a plethora of different welfare tools available over the decades. It is essential to find a universal tool that can be accessed by all animal sectors to centralise our understanding of welfare and ultimately quality of life. The Animal Welfare Assessment Grid is a novel system designed for capturing, storing and visualising animal welfare assessment data over a lifetime for groups and individual animals. It measures four parameters, physical, psychological, environmental and procedural, using factors that are specific to the five freedoms, including positive welfare states. AWAG reflects all five domains and includes a temporal component of any suffering allowing welfare to be quantified and presented in a graphical way that is easily understood and can serve to highlight key events that affect well-being. Species and situation-specific factors are selected within each parameter. Factors are scored between 10 and 1, 10 being the highest score and therefore worst welfare. It is not possible to score zero for any factor. The scores are combined to give the overall score for each parameter. The parameter scores are plotted on four axes of the parameter radar chart, as you can see by the top left picture. The sum of the areas occupied by each parameter radar chart for each time point results in a cumulative welfare assessment score, which is plotted on the cumulative welfare assessment graph, as you can see by the bottom right picture. The time step between plots can be hours to years, ideally over a lifetime. So what is good welfare? It's such a difficult entity to define, and it's unique to the species and usually very subjective. In the context of the AWAG, good welfare is attained when animals are provided with stimulating and appropriate environments, opportunity to exhibit natural behaviours, and when procedures or interventions do not result in pain or suffering, and there is freedom from negative behavioural repertoires. Good welfare is not just freedom from pain, suffering, or disease. It must incorporate positive welfare states. Indicators of negative welfare states will be unique to the species, and this should be considered when selecting factors within parameters. For example, a prey species may not show overt signs of pain. The AWAG allows humans working with animals to have an objective gauge of, the work of their welfare status, to identify early indicators of poor welfare or forecast events that may have negative impacts. So far, the AWAG has already been successfully validated in a wide variety of animals used in research and zoo settings, as you can see from this list. Prior to my project, I undertook a pilot study to validate the use of the AWAG in breeding rhesus macaques. For this study, a higher and a lower ranking female macaque were selected from four different breeding groups, two high impact and two low impact groups. The same rhesus macaques were then used in this project to quantify the impact of novel enrichments on welfare. The novel enrichment being a water bath and food ponds filled with shavings and raisins. Data was collected continuously for seven minutes at five time points throughout the day via observations through the viewing window of their enclosure. 
to show a correlation between enrichment and AWAG score, and the cats were observed before enrichment was introduced, so at 10 a.m., immediately after the enrichment was introduced, which was at 11 a.m., an hour after they'd been with the enrichment, so usually 12 midday, then immediately after the enrichment had been removed, so 12.30 p.m., then two hours after the enrichment had been removed, around 3 p.m. Prior to data collection, a 10-minute adjustment period allowed the cats to acclimatise to the observer's presence. Raw data from the observations were then used retrospectively to score relevant factors on the AWAG software and create a new assessment for that individual. There were three control tests where no enrichment was given and recordings were still taken at the same five time points throughout the day. The predetermined factors were scored against clear definitions. Factors that are not applicable are removed from calculations. Peaks on the graph can be compared with live events to identify key stresses or positive events affecting their welfare and the effect of novel enrichment. Plots along the graph can be selected and by using the corresponding parameter radar chart, a factor breakdown is displayed to allow you to drill down to the key factors that require refinement to improve the overall AWAG score for that individual or group. So why did we use the AWAG on breeding horses and cats? It is known that primates have a greater capacity for psychological suffering by isolation, boredom and restriction of movement. Therefore, engaging their interest in an enriched environment is very important. For non-verbal species, it is difficult to assess welfare without the tendency to anthropomorphize. However, it is essential that the complex and subjective constructs of quality of life should not be oversimplified. Um, sorry, somebody's just told me that it was stuck on a particular slide. I'm sorry about that. Let me just move forward. There have been several studies that demonstrate a link between stereotypes and lack of environmental enrichment. With rhesus macaques still being used in scientific procedures, probably for years to come, typically in long-term studies, it is important we create a tool that, is clearly, that can clearly monitor the welfare over a lifetime. We hypothesised that the introduction of novel enrichments would result in lower AWAG scores and stressful events or veterinary intervention would result in a higher score. The data supported the latter. The project showed that AWAG can provide a data facilitated delivery of objective improvements to the welfare of breeding resistant cats. The project was time limited and there is not enough data to truly show the benefits of using the AWAG tool. However, what it does clearly show is potential. There were significant conclusions drawn from this research project, which I hope illustrates the importance of using the AWAG as a lifetime welfare assessment tool. Although there were inconsistent correlations between introduction of enrichment and reduced AWAG score, there were significant observations regarding rank and interaction with enrichment, which may shape how we use enrichment in groups of macaques in the future. The higher ranking uses macaques consistently scored higher cumulative welfare scores compared to the lower ranking uses macaques, as you can see on these slides. On observation, it was clear the rank of the macaque and the interaction they had with the enrichment was largely different between groups. In low incidence groups, the lower ranking macaques interacted with the enrichment far more than in high incidence groups. The temperament of the male in each breeding group also impacted the time it took to interact with the enrichment. For example, the breeding group with a particularly fractious, nervous and aggressive male took far longer to initially contact the water back, compared to groups which had a relaxed male. Interestingly, the food con, a form of enrichment that required manipulation and problem solving, was largely dominated by the male on initial introduction. After the reward of raisins was gained from all cons, the enrichment was discarded. As soon as the food con was available, it was then handled first by the females, mainly the more dominant ones, who investigated it briefly, then discarded it, and lastly, Dominic. Dominated by the younger adolescents. In contrast, the water bath was a more inclusive enrichment. Macaques with differing ranks were interacted with it at the same time. The females with infants appeared more tentative and were reluctant to interact initially. However, the lower ranking females were quicker to interact. They stayed at the water bath for extended periods of time and they were left alone by the higher ranking females. There were no disputes or threatened behaviours associated with this enrichment. 
the water bath appeared to offer a calmer, less hierarchical dominated group interaction. It was speculated that because the water bath was bigger, it meant there was less competition for space and less of a possessive ownership over enrichment. Studies have shown a positive relationship between water bath enrichment and the cats. This study also supported that. Going forward, it would be encouraged that all centres housing the cats invest time and money into providing water bath enrichment. Negative events such as fights, vet visit days, or periods of segregation all had significant negative welfare impacts. In the future, targeted improvements can be made to minimise the impact of these events. Ideally, a longer term study using historical data with more vectors, more baseline recordings, a variety of enrichments, and a more controlled environment would be necessary to form a more accurate representation of the impact of novel enrichments on the welfare of breeding resistant cats. So what have we learnt so far about the AWAG? The AWAG uses evidence-based conclusions to guide decisions regarding the welfare of the individual or group. The unique benefit of the AWAG is that you can use the cumulative graph to visualise the welfare deterioration over a lifetime, as well as highlighting stressful events or the impact of changing husbandry management or to highlight benefits of new interventions. This study did show that the AWAG provides us with a tool to understand the welfare of animals far better than we have before. It gives us an objective view of welfare so we can see slight deteriorations that would otherwise go unnoticed. The AWAG can be used to justify expenditure on new enrichment because it will show a clear welfare improvement when used. Conversely, it becomes evident when enrichment becomes furniture by measuring the interaction over time. This is about the bigger picture. It's about extrapolating from a small six week study to show what a massive difference this tool would make if used over a lifetime in a variety of species and contexts. The AWAG is not limited to lab animal species. It can be adapted for use in domestic animals. It can be used to develop best practice for farm husbandry. It can be used for captive wild animals in zoos or for sanctuaries and many more. for the future of the AWAG. Funding has now been secured from Agria, Swedish Kennel Club Research Foundation, for a PhD project to further develop the AWAG for use in companion animal species in order to facilitate the assessment of cumulative impact of the various events in an animal's life that affect its welfare. Links are already established with small animal vetting areas to develop factors to score within the four parameters of the AWAG. The existing AWAG app will then be modified to use these factors to score so that it can be defined and validated with companion animal species. The AWAG app will be developed such that it is cloud-based and accessible with pilot studies being run to evaluate the ease of use and to validate the system to identify changes in the welfare state. In due course, by collaborating with companies that are developing the technology for telemetric monitoring of animal behaviours, the AWAG app will be modified to accept this data and the factors that to be measured and used in the assessment of the welfare. To ensure the tool aligns with the requirements of the veterinary community and the different species used, the project will, be, will establish a user forum to enable communication and a feedback channel within the, user, within the user base. Additional funding is now being sought to modify the app appropriately for use in beef and dairy cattle and it is hoped that a version for use in zoos will soon be available too. The AWAG has been cited as a potentially useful tool to assess the welfare and to support organisations such as the RSPCA to intervene earlier, to work in partnership with owners to support claims of risks to animal welfare when investigating and prosecuting animal welfare offences. For further information, please see the link on the slide. With regards to the use of the AWAG in primates, Wild Futures, a sanctuary for primates rescued from the pet trade, are in the process of developing their unique factors and will be using the AWAG to monitor their primates welfare over their life. I would like to close by saying a very heartfelt thank you to Professor Sarah Walkinson for creating the AWAG, for being a pioneer in animal welfare science and for being a brilliant project supervisor. I would also like to say a huge thank you to the Animal Welfare Foundation who supported this project generously and to the Centre for Macaques in Salisbury for allowing me to run this project at that facility and for the staff for supporting me throughout. I would like to thank the NC3Rs for funding the development of the software 
and for Public Health England for developing and working in collaboration to improve the software. Lastly, I'd like to thank the University of Surrey. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Abigail. Um, I know there are a few uh, glitches with the uh, presentation, so apologies for that. Hopefully, um, you got the the main feel of it. Um, so, if you uh, if you have any questions you'd like to uh, direct, and we have one um, immediately from Ryan Heppenstall. She said, "You use the AWAG on macaques in a breeding facility. Has it been used at all yet to look at the welfare of macaques in research facilities, particularly long-term studies?" such as neuroscience? Yeah, so basically at the minute, um, the AWAG has been used, like I said, in these research packs that haven't been used in research. Um, there was a, on the slide, unfortunately it didn't show, but there was a list of all the species. Yeah, there's a list of all the species that it has been validated in. Um, I don't know if, can I show that or do you show that? Yes, if you want to do that, there, I'll just change presenter so you can share your screen. Um, here we go. So you need to accept that. Um, is that, can you see, is that clear? Yes, we can see that. Yeah, so here's a list um, of the species and the, the papers that went alongside with it. Um, it has been used in non-human primates, not just rhesus macaques. Um, in terms of long-term studies, um, because the app is still being developed and it's changed every single time, um, there hasn't been necessarily as much data um, over very long extended periods of time. However, what there has been is use of historic data, um, so we can use that to extrapolate um, from previous, from data that was recorded previously. Sorry, I don't know if my, it keeps flicking. Yeah, Is that so, clear? Sorry, I don't yeah. know if that, I don't know if that works. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you've got the screens showing so far non-human primates, giraffes, some to horned yeah. oryx and things. Um, okay, so we have another question from um, you know, Franco, uh, and he said, if I, I understood it correctly, one of the AWAG domains is environmental, environment-centred rather than animal-centred. Do you consider using interactions with environment instead? Or did you consider using interactions with environment instead? So um, in terms of the four parameters, um, interaction with enrichment, so their environment around them is considered. Um, so environment itself is broken down. And again, that was on a slide. I'll just see if I can find. Um, so here you can see that environmental is provision of 3D enrichment, provision of manipulative enrichment. Um, and you can also see that there's interaction with enrichment as well. Um, so use of enrichment and just psychological. Um, so we do take into consideration um, that from an animal's perspective and also from obviously the environmental perspective as well. Um, another question from Penny Hawkins from the RSPCA. Are you aware of any AWAG users who used it to track animal well-being through a process of rescue and rehabilitation? Um, so the Wild Futures, um, I don't know if that, that bit works, um, the Wild Futures was um, is a rehabilitation centre where they take um, primates that have been in the pet trade and um, rehabilitated in the centre um, and they stay there, they have different interactions with different, they put them into groups if possible. Um, so in terms of their rehabilitation process, um, it's, it's really well documented um, and that's, that's obviously something that will be really successful in the future um, because they're creating their specific factors that would be really relevant to rescue and rehabilitation of primates rather than, for example, experimental, the factors that you score will be very different. So the AWAG can be uniquely um, altered to suit that situation specifically. Thank you. Um, question from Bjorn Falkman, University of Copenhagen. He said, can you say exactly what you mean by it being validated? Yeah, so um, the AWAG has been used, like I said, in, in lots of studies. Um, I try to put that on these slides. Um, and it's so recently it was, for example, recently it was used um, for three research projects um, by students um, at the University of Surrey. Um, they used it for the species that were, that were on the list, um, Highland cattle. Um, and what so but in terms of validation, um, what we mean is that it can successfully show whether there has been a, an, an influence of, for example, if there was enrichment and um, whether it can show negative events and how that impacts the welfare. So. 
for example, in the rhesus macaques on vet visit days, um, where they're stressful events, um, some of the macaques are sedated um, and there's, it, there's disruption within the hierarchy because they're separated off into different groups, et cetera. Um, the AY can, can very clearly show that that has a detrimental impact. Um, what the AY also shows is that around times that would be that would induce positive welfare states. So, for example, if they're feeding enrichment, um, sorry, if they're feeding um, introduction of new enrichment, things like that, um, it's very obvious that the welfare implications of that are very easily documented with the AWAG. Um, and I think that the main point of the AWAG is that you can clearly see that there is a trend and whether there's a pattern um, and, and that the AWAG can reflect that. And, and obviously, there are really well documented if, um, events that would show. Um, positive or negative state. So the AWAG is really good at being able to um, visualise that and show that. Thank you. Um, a question for someone uh, said, my concern is where can we get the AWAG assessment tool? They, they said that they might have missed it in your presentation if you want to just uh, repeat that again. Yeah, so at the minute um, it's being developed with Public Health England um, and that's because it was used in this study. Um, so obviously on this can you still see my screen is that yes we can yes yeah okay brilliant um so now it's being developed obviously for use in domestic animals so the software itself then will be developed um so it will it will be developed by sorry that didn't make any sense um so the software is currently being developed by public health england of which they can uh, they can send you your own domain which means that you can have a pilot study um, and run it separately so for anybody that is that thinks that it would be relevant in their animal set that where they work and um, in the sector that they work in then please feel free to contact us because we're more than happy to get this distributed as widely as possible and um, to get it used in different um, sectors to get the the factors specific to where it's used as well so um so if it, basically to get it trialed in as many situations as possible so um that currently is is being run and and public health England can send um on a on a pilot study and um, trial run essentially um, and we can organize details um, from there and obviously when it's developed further for domestic species as well okay thank you um and uh somebody asked as far as i understand the awag is weighting each category physical procedural environmental equally but isn't that like comparing apples with pears yeah so essentially within each perhaps so there's four parameters when, say, for example, um, uh, an event happens that impacts, say, their physical health um, or, or a procedure example, that's probably an easier example. So if there's if there's a procedure that impacts that a specific factor within the procedural um, parameter, it won't be independent of all the other parameters. So, for example, if there's been a procedure, it will then affect their ability to to move around. So obviously their physical, their mobility, their activity levels will drop. It'll also probably affect their social interactions with each other. So then again, it's affecting a different parameter. So then they're, they're all interrelated. They're not independent of each other. Um, so what it would, so instead of sort of thinking that, oh, okay, well, we'll just try and equalize this because it's only affected one parameter. That, that's, that's not really the case. Um, and the AWAG tries to show that, that it has a cumulative effect and that it isn't just an, one species, one factor that affects this and, and doesn't have an impact on the other parameters. If that, makes sense. I think it does. Well, thank you, Abigail. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. As I said, that if there are any more, um, you can clearly contact Abigail yourself via the email in the abstract booklet, and we will share the other questions with Abigail after the meeting. So we now move on to the third presenter of the uh, session one, which is Andrew Crump. Um, he's from the Queen's University Belfast, and he is going to be uh, looking at um, integrating behavioural, cognitive, and physiological welfare indicators. Um, I would also sorry, like excuse me, uh, just shut that one down. Um, so, um, behavioural welfare indicators, an example using pasture access to improve emotional state uh, states in dairy cows. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student at Queen's University Belfast and today I'll be talking about how we can use cognitive, behavioural and physiological welfare indicators to measure the impact of pasture access on emotional state in dairy cows. 
Before I do that, though, I'd just like to thank the organisers of this conference, uh, especially for putting it together at such short notice. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my collaborators, particularly my supervisors, Gareth Arnott and Emily Bethel. So when we imagine dairy farms, we tend to think about cows living in environments like the one on the left, these beautiful green fields. Uh, but the reality, at least for many cows for much of the time, is that they'll actually be living in housing like the image on the right. And this can be either continuous housing, where the animals are kept indoors all year round. Uh, this is now the norm in countries like Greece or the Czech Republic or Bulgaria. Uh, alternatively, cows can be let outdoors during the summer uh, but even, even in these pasture-based systems, they'll still be kept inside uh, for months at a time over winter and around calving. So this is the standard housing system for, for instance, the UK and Ireland. And as we can all probably imagine, having spent the last three months being shut indoors, this kind of long-term housing can have serious welfare impacts. So it's associated with diseases, lameness and mastitis incidences tend to be higher when cows are kept indoors. Uh, but we don't understand very well how housing influences the emotional aspect of welfare. So does pasture access improve psychological well-being in dairy cows? Now, when we talk about emotions or psychological well-being in animals, the, uh, the kind of holy grail would be a measure of conscious what we call feelings in animals. So the su subjective part of an emotion. Unfortunately, because animals can't convey in words how they're feeling, uh, we don't have a measure of consciousness. We can't directly access it. Uh, so instead, we have to look at other changes associated with emotions. And in particular, uh, changes in cognition, so the way that animals gather and process information, changes in behavior, and changes in physiology. And most welfare research tends to look at these individually. So they might measure just cognition or just behavior or just physiology. Uh, but in our study, we were trying to look at all three simultaneously in order to give a more complete picture of the animal's emotional responses to pasture access. So these were our individual hypotheses uh, in terms of the cognitive aspect of emotion, uh, judgment bias. Uh, we predicted that cows at pasture or cows with access to pasture uh, would be more optimistic than cows without, indicating this more positive emotional state. Uh, in terms of behavioural indicators of cow emotions, we use lying behaviour uh, because this is a really important uh, part of comforting cows. So we predicted longer lying durations, uh, but fewer lying bouts. Uh, so longer total lying time, uh, but less uh, fewer transitions between lying and standing. And this would indicate that cows at pasture were more comfortable, had a more comfortable surface, uh, and were less restless. And then finally, in terms of a, an indicator of physiology, uh, we used eye temperature. Uh, this one's a bit more controversial and arguably is a more short term measure. Uh, but the basic idea here is that when animals have a stress response, uh, it leads to an increase in core body temperature as blood is diverted to the core organs like the heart and the lungs. And this is predicted to lead to a reduction in peripheral body temperature as blood is diverted away from the eyes, the ears, the nose. And so we predict this increase or greater eye temperature in cows with pasture access than cows indoors uh, because they have less of that uh, stress response leading to core hyperthermia. There were 29 animals in this study. Uh, so we divided them into two groups, uh, 14 in one group and 15 in the other. And then we carried out a two phase repeated measures crossover experiment. So for 19 days, uh, group one were given access to pasture uh, overnight. So this was between around 4.30 p.m. and around 10 o'clock the next morning. The reason that we picked this overnight or restricted pasture access uh, timing is because this is the time when cows given the choice seem to show a really strong preference for pasture. So then during the daytime, uh, these cows were kept indoors. Uh, group two, uh, in that pen treatment, they were kept indoors 24 hours a day. So all of the cows were indoors from around 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., uh, but only group one were let out to pasture overnight. And then we swapped over the treatments for phase two, so another 19 days. So the cows that had been let out to pasture overnight were kept indoors 24 hours a day and vice versa. And throughout both of these phases, uh, we measured all those different welfare indicators. So the judgment bias, the lying behaviour 
uh, and the eye temperature. So to measure the judgment bias or optimism, uh, we used a typical judgment bias task, a spatial judgment bias task. Uh, so we first of all train the cows that if a bucket was located on one side of an alleyway, at the rewarded location, uh, it contained concentrates, which is this very desirable feed. So the cows learned that when they saw the bucket uh, on that side of the alleyway at the rewarded location, they would run down the alley to get some food. Uh, if, however, the bucket uh, was on the other side of the alley at the unrewarded location, it was empty. So the animals learned to run for the rewarded location. Uh, but if instead the bucket was at the unrewarded location, uh, they either went much slower or they didn't bother. So there was only ever one bucket present, uh, but in different trials, it was at different locations. And then in order to measure judgment bias or anticipation of reward under ambiguous circumstances, uh, we introduced the animals during the testing period to buckets at three intermediate locations. And so our hypothesis here was really that animals in the pasture treatment would be faster to these intermediate buckets than animals that were being kept indoors all the time. So animals at pasture would be more optimistic, demonstrating a more positive emotional state. Uh, I'm going to go through the results first and then move on to the methods for behavior. So this, these are data from all of the animals throughout both phases, both treatments uh, for each of the five bucket locations. And the two key points here really are that firstly, uh, the animals did learn the discrimination task. So you can see they did have significantly shorter latencies to that rewarded location uh, than to the unrewarded location. So they were faster to get the reward. And then secondly, uh, you get these really nice graded responses for the three intermediate locations, where the closer they are to the reward, uh, the faster the animals were going to them. Uh, and this is important because for judgment bias tasks, uh, a key assumption is that the animals are not just treating these intermediate stimuli uh, as novel stimuli, but are in fact treating them as intermediate. So these graded responses show that that is the case. So moving on to treatment effects, uh, and all of the data in this presentation were analysed using general linear mixed effects models. Uh, this graph shows the results uh, based on treatment for latency to all five locations. So when we include both the rewarded and the unrewarded uh, and all of those three ambiguous locations. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we got some quite surprising results on this. So animals in the pasture treatment were actually slower uh, when we looked at all five locations than animals in that indoor housing treatment. And this is the opposite of what we predicted, right? We predicted that animals at pasture uh, would be more optimistic, so they'd have shorter response latencies. Uh, we actually saw the opposite. Uh, but when we probe that a bit deeper uh, and look at only the ambiguous locations, because remember judgment bias uh, is looking at optimism under uncertainty, we find that that effect actually disappears. So we find no significant effect of treatment uh, on responses to those ambiguous locations on judgment bias. So this kind of raised the question of what's going on here. And in order to better understand these data, uh, we ran the model separately for each of the five locations individually. And when we did that, we found that the only location which gave this significant result was the rewarded location, that positive location. So when the animals knew that they were getting a reward, uh, they were slower towards it in the pasture treatment uh, than when they've been kept indoors. And we think that the reason for this is not judgment bias, but is instead uh, showing uh, reward anticipation. So although it hasn't been as well studied as judgment bias, uh, there is animal welfare research indicating that reward anticipation can tell us about animal psychological well-being. And the basic idea is illustrated by this graph. So when you find yourself with lots of positive events in your day and few negative events, so on the left hand side of this graph, you show quite a low anticipation intensity towards any one of those positive events because there's going to be lots of others that come along as well. However, as you shift towards the left of the graph, as you have fewer positive events and more negative events, each one of those positive events is going to become more important to you. And so your anticipation intensity increases. Uh, this occurs until you get into the blue box, uh, which indicates chronic stress. And here you see a sharp drop off in anticipation intensity, which is essentially the learned helplessness or anhedonia response. So the reason that we think this explains uh, our cow's latency towards the rewarded bucket in particular 
is that we think that the animals in the pasture treatment uh, were further towards the left of this graph. They had more positive events in their day and fewer negative events. They had this more comfortable lying substrate, they had more space to move around, less competition. Uh, and so this, re this uh, rewarded bucket meant a bit less to them because they had lots more positive things going on in their lives. However, cows that were kept indoors all day, they had far fewer positive events, possibly more negative events, things like interspecific aggression. And so they found themselves further to the right of this graph. And this is why you see the increased uh, latency to that rewarded bucket in the pasture treatment, because they're less, if you like, excited about that positive event. Uh, you could also interpret this as cows in the pasture treatment further into that learned helplessness, chronic stress response. Uh, but fortunately, we can rule that out because we have daily step count data uh, for cows in both treatments. Uh, and cows in the pasture treatment were having substantially higher daily step counts, so they weren't showing this kind of learned helplessness uh, or the lethargy associated with learned helplessness. OK, so moving on to behaviour, uh, we measured this using uh, ice cube sensors. So these are hind leg activity monitor sensors. They have a triaxial accelerometer uh, and essentially they me measure things like lying, uh, standing, all to a very high temporal resolution. Uh, and so when we look at total duration of lying time, uh, we find that in line with our predictions, cows in the pasture treatment were showing these significantly longer daily lying times uh, than cows kept indoors. So again, this indicates that cows at pasture were more comfortable, maybe facing less interspecific aggression for lying space and had this more comfortable lying surface. Uh, despite these longer total lying times, uh, the number of lying bouts, again, as predicted, uh, was smaller in the pasture treatment. So animals at pasture were having fewer but longer lying bouts every day than cows kept indoors. And they also had fewer transitions between lying and standing. And all this indicates that cows at pasture were less restless uh, and more comfortable in their environment. And then finally, physiology. Uh, so we measured this using these infrared cameras. We took thermal images of the cow's head. Uh, we did this every time we ran a judgment bias test. Uh, so after we ran the judgment bias test, we would take these thermal images and then we extracted eye temperature uh, from software online. So these data were again opposite to what we predicted. Uh, we hypothesized that cows at pasture would have uh, higher eye temperatures, reflecting their lower core temperatures. Uh, but we actually observed that cows at pasture had lower eye, eye temperatures than animals kept indoors all day. Uh, we're not entirely sure why this is. Uh, certainly, certainly when we look at weather variables, which you would expect to have an effect, things like temperature, uh, wind speed, relative humidity, they actually don't seem to have uh, much of an influence at all. So our, our best explanation at the moment is that we think that maybe uh, cows in the pasture treatment Perhaps they're in more positive emotional states overnight when they're at pasture, but then when they're brought indoors, uh, that stresses them out to be confined indoors because they're less used to it than cows that are kept in indoor housing. Uh, and thermography is generally speaking seen as a measure of acute or short term stress. So perhaps it's that short term stress response to being brought indoors uh, which leads to this result. Uh, but if anyone has a better explanation, then please let me know. So looking at our overall results, uh, we found that uh, pasture did not affect judgment bias, uh, but in the same task, it did seem to affect reward anticipation, uh, possibly because animals that have been at pasture had more rewards in their day. They valued that rewarded bucket less highly. Uh, lying duration increased at pasture, but there were fewer lying bouts, indicating that cows were more comfortable and less restless. Uh, and eye temperature also decreased at pasture, possibly indicating an acute stress response to being brought indoors. So overall, I think these data uh, do suggest that cows' uh, psychological well-being is improved by access to pasture. But the bigger takeaway here is that it's important to measure multiple different welfare indicators uh, because they're not necessarily consistent. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Um, Thanks, Neil. So we've got uh, some questions um, from people, and there's been quite a few. Um, 
I'll start with an easy one. I've shared some of these with Andrew while I was on. So um, Megan Jones from the University of the West of Scotland says, in regards to using eye temperature, could it give you false results if, for instance, it's an incredibly hot or cold day? Yeah, absolutely. So there's various compounds with eye temperature. And in fact, during this study, we had the hottest day in Northern Ireland's history, which was 30 degrees. Um, we've looked at the effect of sort of climate variables, so daily temperature, uh, relative humidity, wind speed. And surprisingly, and against sort of the grain of previous studies, we didn't find um, an effect of those temperature variables for reasons kind of unknown. Uh, previous studies certainly have and found that they do have an, an influence in our study. The models um, were better when we removed those variables. So um, not in our case, but you would expect yes. Thank you. Uh, another question. Did you take into account factors such as age, lactation stage, and production parameters of the single cows? And if not, do you think these data could have influenced your models? Yes, yeah, so we took into account age. Um, that did have an influence on the behaviour, although not the thermography and the judgment bias data, although it did influence the total latency to all locations. It didn't influence latency to either the ambiguous or the positive. Um, it did influence line behaviour. You got kind of the expected um changes where animals which were older were lying for longer um, with more lying bouts um, animals were all broadly at the same stage of lactation um, but we didn't take that into account um, and then the last thing was uh, production data yes uh, which we we couldn't collect but it would certainly be interesting to do that um, to kind of look at physiology cognition uh, and then production as well as behavior um so uh, another question um was could the house cows have been more hungry because they don't have access to pasture throughout the day making them have more of a drive for concentrates and therefore having a shorter latency yeah great question and something we were quite concerned about during the design of the study so basically the way it was designed all the animals were inside during the day uh, for testing so between about 10 o'clock and about 4 30 and then the cows at pasture were outdoors overnight so overnight they had a difference in the sort of nutrition so cows at pasture had pasture whereas animals indoors had silage uh, they all had the same silage rations during the day in order to check whether that had an effect um, we ended up doing it statistically by looking at time of day effects so your expectation would be that if it was the case that animals that had been either at pasture or indoors were hungrier you would see that effect strongest at the start of the day when they both had the longest period of difference and the least period of the same nutrition. Um, we didn't find those time of day effects. So from that, we concluded that it wasn't the case that animals in one or the other treatment were hungrier. But yeah, great question. Um, a question from Wendy. She says, uh, could the eye temperature be related to a higher activity level of the pasture cows? Yeah, and I, I would say that this is probably, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's, arguably more of an indicator of sort of general arousal um, than, than necessarily whether the state is positive or negative. Um, I'm just looking at that data again. But yes, I think that's so probably... Your, do you want to share your screen with people to, so they can see it? Uh, yeah, how do I do that? Right, right, let me just make you the presenter. Sure. And you need to now accept that you want to share your screen. Cool. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Um, so yeah, in, in that situation, um, again, you would potentially expect animals at pasture. Well, I suppose, yeah, higher core body temp. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good explanation of the data. So if the animals had a higher core body temperature, they'd have lower perif peripheral temperature. Thank you, that's a good explanation. Um, question from Jeremy Skews. He said, were the differences between the two groups, group one moving from pasture to indoors is a different experience from group two? Yeah, so we did find, the order effects that you'd expect from this is a question i get asked quite often about this i'm reticent to read too much into it um, because in terms of order effects we only have the one group in each order um, but we did find the sort of expected effects that you would imagine whether say the reduction in uh, lying duration was bigger when the animals were moved from outdoors to indoors rather than at the start of the experiment where they had all had the same experience of indoors so the indoor treatment there they were essentially a bit more used to it we didn't find order effects in terms of the judgment bias data um but yeah in terms of the behavior we saw what you would expect but 
I don't think that this in itself is good enough evidence that that is um, what's happening because of the sample size, but previous studies have also found that. Um, so yes, we did see the expected order effects. Um, time for another, I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, Paul Rose says, thank you for the really interesting talk, one that really is really practical to those working with dairy cows. Did you or would you measure rumination time alongside lying duration, lying bouts? And does this differ based on what the cows are being fed on? Would a cow that needs milking be more restless and spend less time lying than a cow that's been milked? Or was that factored into the experimental design? Um, good question. Uh, so we didn't measure that. It would certainly be something that's useful um, to measure in order to take it into account. The animals went to the parlor at the same time in order to control for, in both treatments, in order to control for the effects of, of milking time. Um, if that answers the question. And um, final one is, uh, would you consider using cortisol measures in feces to replace ice temperature as a physiological parameter? Yeah, absolutely. So originally when we were designing this study, that was certainly the plan. Um, but in the end, uh, time, cost and practicality prevented us from doing that. I think, uh, yeah, certainly fecal cortisol, even hair cortisol would be just about arguably the right sort of time length for, for these phases um, would have been a great measure um, and hasn't actually has been done surprisingly little for this kind of study comparing uh, dairy welfare sort of indoors versus a uh, pasture considering the number of studies that compare behavior there's been very little on cortisol so we're working to do it uh, but yeah um, we, we weren't able to in the end but yeah good suggestion so well excellent thank you very much Andrew uh, there are some other questions which I'll also share with you so thank you very much for your talk Thanks. Um, Thank you. We'll now move on to the last speaker in session one, which is Lauren Finker um, from Nottingham Trent University. And she's going to be looking at whether anthropocentric uh, breed selection has disrupted an animal's ability to communicate. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Lauren Finker and I work as a researcher at Nottingham Trent University. I'm very happy to be involved in this virtual UFOR conference and my talk is going to focus on anthropocentric breed selection and its potential to disrupt the communicative abilities of animals. So I've included a question mark intentionally in the, the title of this talk because I'm not going to provide definitive proof that this is actually happening, but I'm more hope, hoping to demonstrate the uh, novel application of a technique to, to be able to explore this phenomenon in more detail. So if we consider the impact of domestication on animals, we see it's not just their behaviour which has um, been radically changed and diversified from that of their ancestors. We also see key differences in their coat colours, their ear and tail shape and size, their craniofacial morphology and also regional and overall brain size as well. And if we focus specifically on companion species, Particularly, we see in recent years um, more emphasis on aesthetics rather than health, function and performance, and this may drive the selection for particular features. We also see uh, the rise in pedomorphic or human infant-like features in many companion species. These are now present in dogs, cats, horses and rabbits, for example. And it's thought that these sorts of pedomorphic features may trigger a nurturing response in humans, and they may actually be preferred um, and um, subsequently these animals are more likely to be selected or adopted if they display these particular characteristics. So what we're potentially seeing is this rapid increase in selection for non-functional features which is also creating a greater amount of diversity within various species as well. Um, and if we think about the studies that have looked at the impact of this type of selection and um, the diversity in morphology that it creates in relation to the, the functioning of animals. Most of this has really looked at their physiology. And what we see is that there are certain conformation disorders that are more prevalent in certain breeds of dogs, such as miniature poodles, bulldogs, pugs, and basset hounds. We also see evidence linking brachiocephalism to um, restriction in the breathing abilities of dogs and also respiratory abnormalities in cats. We see brachiocephalism and thicker coats linked to increased heat stroke risk, again um, looking at dogs. 
And in Scottish fold cats, we see progressive joint disease within this uh, breed, which is linked to a, a dominant inherited gene. But what we haven't really done is really try to understand how um, anthropogenically mediated variations in the morphology of these species might impact on other aspects of their functioning, such as their communication and their ability to um, be understood and understand conspecifics and also humans. For non-verbal individuals, the face and the, the diversity in the expressions that can be produced by the face may be a really important form of communication. And such facial expressions seem to be highly conserved across a range of different animal species and are thought to be associated with aspects of self-preservation, such as care, solicitation, conflict avoidance, and also stimuli reduction. So whilst variation in the visual appearance of the face may be really important in terms of conveying specific uh, affective states or intentions, we see a great diversity in the baseline appearance of faces across particularly cats and dogs. And um, this relates to a great diversity in cephalic shapes and potentially also diversity in the musculature within the face as well. So a recent study looking at musculature differences in uh, wolves and, and dogs found that dogs had a more well-developed muscle which supports the inner eyebrow-raising expression. Now, in humans, this expression is thought to convey the feeling of sadness. We don't necessarily know if this is what dogs are trying to convey, but it again demonstrates the impact of uh, domestication and diversification from ancestors and the way that it may um, potentially influence the expressive abilities of the face in these species. Facial expressions are, however, notoriously difficult to objectively study and quantify. Um, but there are potentially novel techniques out there that we may be able to apply to, to give us a much better, more biologically based way to assess this. So this is something that um, I recently developed in a, in a paper that was published last year with colleagues from Nottingham Trent University and also the University of Lincoln. Uh, what we did was apply uh, geometric morphometrics to the study of facial shape, shape variation in domestic cats. Now, geometric morphometrics as a, a tool has a, evolved quite considerably over the process of its development. And now what we're able to do is actually pinpoint specific landmarks and look at their relationship to, to one another, rather than just looking at the specific variation of linear distances. We can actually take a 3D representation or a 2D representation of the face or of a structure as a whole and look to see um, how the relationship between those specific landmarks vary across um, different uh, breeds, uh, species, or even uh, just uh, conditions within a species. So this is the approach I used in domestic cats. Because we understand quite a lot about their musculature, it was possible to develop a series of landmarks which could capture the muscle insertion points from images of, of cats' faces. So these are the, the points which mo move during muscle contraction. And also to capture the output of specific expressions or facial action units. So these have been mapped out um, in a, a cat fax, which is basically a system to quantify the shape changes that are produced by, by cats when they uh, perform different expressions. So um, placing landmarks in this way basically means that we can hopefully capture all the relevant um, diversity in facial shape change, which is relevant to the um, production of various uh, expressions in this species. And this then allows us to look at potential um, variation in uh, facial shape across different conditions. So um, this is what I did to understand how the shape of the face may change in relation to the experience of pain. So for this study, we inherited a, a nice data set that had um, examples of the same cats experiencing clinically controlled uh, variation intensity of pain. This was pain in relation to a very hysterectomy. Um, and the pain intensities varied from pre-surgery, post-surgery, before rescue analgesia, after rescue analgesia, and then 24 hours after surgery. And for this population, they had also been given a well-validated composite uh, pain score. So we could actually look to see if the geometric morphometric method um, and its quantification of the face correlated with um, 
other um, assessments of pain not relating to the face as well. So this kind of gives more validation for the approach that we used. And what we found was that um, using a morphometric method, we could actually quantify the nature and intensity of the facial shape changes within individuals across the different pain intensities. And we found that this um, significantly correlated with uh, uh, the composite behavioral score of, of pain that did not include features of the face. So now we know that these facial landmarks are able to capture changes in the facial expressions of cats in association with different intensities of an internal affective state. We can then apply these landmarks in a slightly different way to look at variation in their positioning, not caused by an internal affective state, but simply caused by variations in uh, different breeds of cats and also cephalic uh, shapes as well. So we used a similar method of data extraction as in the, the previous study. And um, what we were now really interested in is looking to see how these specific landmarks, which we know uh, relate to changes in um, internal states that may have some communicative value, may change um, just as a function of the, um, the morphology of individuals at a state of baseline. So not when they're actually expressing a particular affective state, just um, when their, their faces are in a neutral position. So um, we selected 19 popular breeds and um, extracted uh, the facial landmarks, so the, the, the 48 XY coordinates from um, unique images across the different breed groups. All these landmarks are manually annotated and they demonstrated good inter um, annotator reliability in the previous study. We then uh, used PCA to, to identify key sources of shape variation within our diverse population. And again, we represented these with a series of lollipop graphs, which I'll show you in a minute, um, basically are a way to represent the shape variation captured within each of our PC uh, composites. And we could then look to see how these PC scores, so these PC scores which explain this variation, uh, varied uh, relevant to the cephalic types of the cats and also their breeds as well. So um, we found four key uh, PCs which explained most of the diversity within our um, 19 different uh, group breed groups and um, of these three of the PCs seem to relate specifically to variation in um, the, the landmarks caused by morphology rather than just pose. It can be very difficult to actually capture full frontal images of cats. There's often a little bit of uh, pose within um, these sorts of images. So for example, with our PC2, we thought that this is potentially linked to a lateralized pose because you wouldn't expect certain breeds to have a, have a wonky face, for example. So we were able to discount this that PC and actually just retain PCs one, three, and four. And we, when we compared PC scores uh, across our different cephalic types, we found that these were all significantly different to to one another. And so for our bra bra brachycephalic type of face, so these are the the cats with the more rounded face shape with the eyes and, and muzzle um, closer together and a, a much more uh, shortened uh, muzzle as well. These cats had higher uh, PC1, PC3 and PC4 scores compared to the mesocephalic and dolichocephalic types of faces. The mesocephalic type face is that the, the sort of the default domestic uh, cat face where things are, are sort of relatively in proportion and our dolichocephalic face is a more of a triangular shape so um, a much more elongated uh, muzzle and potentially larger ears in some cases as well. So as well as identifying sub substantial variation in the, the default or baseline positioning of these landmarks at the cephalic level, we also found a lot of variation at the breed level. In our mesocephalic face type breeds, these guys actually had uh, more overlap in terms of the, the positioning of their landmarks. And this was in stark contrast to the brachycephalic face types, which actually um, across breeds within this group did not overlap uh, 
particularly much at all. So they're all showing distinct variation in the, the default position of their, their facial landmarks. And, um, and all of these breeds were actually very dissimilar to um, those within the mesocephalic and the dolichocephalic breed groups as well. So to really then test the, the, the hypothesis, whether this amount of diversity within these facial landmarks may actually make it quite difficult to detect um, specific expressions related to an internal state. We then um, took the, our understanding of the way that these landmarks move in relation to pain in particular, um, and we applied this to our, our data set of our, our, our diverse breeds. So in the second part of this study, we gave a facial pain score, which was based on our PC, which describes the way that the face is changing um, with an increased intensity of, a, of pain being experienced. And we gave this facial pain score to um, a, a subsample of the images of cats across the different breeds that we looked at. And we also um, extracted facial pain scores from cats that we knew, domestic shorthead cats we knew were not in pain. So these are from the previous study um, and they are um, after they've uh, received surgery and after they've been given rescue analgesia. And we also had um, images of the same cats with a, again with a facial pain score when they had just um, undergone surgery but hadn't yet received their pain relief. So we've got a, uh, examples of clinically controlled conditions relating to pain and no pain. And then we also had um, pain scores from the subset of our um, different breeds of cats across the different groups. And then we were able to compare uh, variation in these pain scores um, across this population. So when we compared the facial pain scores um, from our neutral examples across our brachycephalic, mesocephalic and dolichocephalic face types, what we found was that the, the neutral expressions of brachycephalic face types actually uh, had scored higher on our pain scoring uh, scale compared to the mesocephalic and the dolichocephalic face types. Um, but we also found that there was no difference in the pain scores between the baseline expressions of, our, of the meso and the dolichocephalic faces. So what we're seeing potentially is that within the brachycephalic um, facial shape, this is representative of more pain-like expressions. And when we look at differences in these facial pain scores at the, the individual breed level, we also see some interesting results. So whilst the facial pain scores were able to discriminate between pain and no pain cats in our domestic shorthaired group, there was a lot of overlap between uh, pain in domestic shorthaired cats and um, no pain examples across all the other different breeds of, of cats that we looked at. So even though the examples in all these breeds are of neutral faces that are not displaying pain, as far as we could ascertain, some of these um, facial expressions were indicating they had the, a greater presence of pain-like features compared to domestic shorthaired cats that were actually in pain. So this is particularly relevant to the, the case of Scottish fold cats. Actually, of all the cats, these cats, their, their facial pain scores indicated a much higher prevalence of pain um, compared to the other breeds. Then if we look at uh, breeds within our dolichocephalic group, certain breeds such as the sphinx cats, their facial pain scores actually indicated um, a, a much lower um, prevalence of pain-like features. So it might be that actually certain um, cephalic types or certain breeds, the way that their default facial morphology is structured means that they may be expressing greater or lesser pain-like features that we know exist in our, our domestic short-haired cats at least. Um, the the waxes might be a little bit confusing, but basically a, a lower FP score um, actually corresponds to a, a greater presence of, of pain-like uh, features. Okay. So what these results are uh, suggesting is that the diversity at a baseline level in these facial landmarks across breeds is much greater than the diversity in these landmarks that are caused by the expression of certain states within a breed. So when we look at cats as a whole, 
um, this might actually disrupt our ability to identify the expression of certain states or intentions at an individual level because we see so much variability in baseline landmarks um, just as a, a result of the, the variations in um, the morphology of these animals um, as a consequence of the way that we've shaped and, and bred and selected them. So I think the next steps are really to understand the implications of this diversity in relation to the ability of us and also conspecifics to detect and decode these potential uh, visual signals, not just in the face, but also other aspects of um, animals morphology that have been impacted by their selection um, and, and also in other species as well. So the, the, the morphological changes that we see in domestic cats are also common in a range of other um, companion animal species. Um, and there's also the, the, the theory that because um, certainly in individuals with very extreme features, because this might limit their ability to use visual forms of communication to be clearly understood, they may actually then tend to rely more on other modalities of communication such as uh, vocalizations or olfaction. So this is a really another a really important avenue of further research to see actually if this is the case. So do individuals that may be more compromised in their, their visual ability to communicate, do we see uh, an increased reliance on these other modalities? And finally, also because within our study, we found that certain brachycephalic breeds, in particular Scottish fold cats, had facial pain scores that indicated a greater presence of pain-like features, even though as far as we could ascertain, they weren't in pain. This suggests that perhaps as well as us selecting for pedomorphic features, um, we may also inadvertently be selecting for features that are associated with negative affect, such as pain. So perhaps as well as um, being drawn to more infantile features, we're also drawn to, to features which um, may similarly sort of indicate um, the need for us to uh, provide care for, for individuals. So uh, again, a really interesting outcome and, and something that would that uh, warrants further exploration. So that brings us to the end of the talk. Thanks ever so much for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. An interesting talk. Um, if you want to turn your camera on, it would be fantastic. So people can uh, see you. Um, so, hi. hello, hi. Um, hi, so, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, thank you. So I've um, got a range of questions. Uh, first one is from Eileen Pipers. She says, when selecting photos to map faces, how do you choose a neutral face? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's not an exact science because um, my whole point is really it's very difficult to be able to um, understand meaningful variation in the faces of these very diverse populations. Um, so what I did use was the facial action coding system, which is a standardized system to be able to um, identify these biologically uh, based changes in, in, in expressions of domestic cats. So this is something that you um, can study and you can like take a test and you can become a, a cat facts certified coder. So it gives you um, a certain level of assurance that you're able to identify changes in expressions in a reliably consistent way. Um, but it but it is a, a little bit problematic, certainly because when you're looking at these still images, I mean, expressions are supposed to really be coded dynamically. So the whole point of being able to, to see them in, in a temporal way um, enables you to really um, understand when an expression has occurred. So, it, so it, it is challenging to be able to apply this to, to still images. Um, but this was the most uh, valid technique that was available to be able to, to try and do this. So, so definitely not um, an exact science, but hopefully the um, I was as equally good or bad across all the, the images of the breed and be able to identify those that were um, in a neutral state. Thank you. Um, and Julia Barber asks, is it currently planned to extend this to other companion animals like dogs or rabbits? And also, is that method at all transferable to dogs, for example, where you have even more uh, variation in skull morphology? Yes, um, I think it would definitely be great to, to extend this to other species. I think this method potentially could, could be really useful. 
Um, with dogs, I think we'd need to take a more 3D approach. So, so geomorphic morphometrics can actually be used to capture uh, more 3D examples of images. That's not something that I've uh, done yet. I was lucky enough that with domestic cats, it's relatively easy to to, to just annotate from from 2D images of them. Um, with with dogs, I think you definitely need to factor in the 3D element because obviously they've got such a elongated muzzle, and the you know the the side of the face can look very different from the front of the face and obviously particularly if you're working from still images there's so much variation in the distance between landmarks just based on the angle uh, from which you'd, you'd take an image so it might be slightly easier to do in rabbits for example um, but I think definitely this, this technique could be applied with some um, slight tweaks and additions to, to uh, a range of other species for sure. Thank you. Um... We had a question um, from uh, Samuel Kirk, who said, uh, can you, uh, do you have reference to any scientific paper that spoke about cat facial expressions, please? Um, yeah, so I've, I don't know if you can see, I've posted the link to the, the, the paper that we published last year um, in the comments box. Um, so that was the one that, that explored the, the use of this technique um, to look at changes in the expressions of cats associated with, with pain. Um, uh, I think uh, hopefully that's that's the one that he's mentioning. Um, there's also there's, there's, within the talk there should be references to the cat facts, which is the the manual to support um, reliable identification of of facial shape changes. Um, and then I can definitely there's a couple of um, other papers that have looked at differences in facial expressions associated with other affective states. So there's one from a couple of years ago in behavioural processes that looked at differences in, I think it's relaxed engagement, um, anxiety and frustration. So uh, I can I can post those as well. Um, can you see the one that I posted so far? Is, does it work if um, I put them in the comments? Yeah, no, I, I will share that with I'll share that with with people later on. Um, thank you. So. Um, one of the other questions we've had, and I'll try and get that over while you're answering this one, um, is it possible that age has an effect on the findings? Um, yeah, I, I guess interesting. So I, I know that certainly we, we used um, for the validation study, the first one that the, um, the link I've, I've posted for is, should be there now. Um, Yes, so we used adult cats because obviously the the, the face of uh, kittens and, and um, pre-adult individuals would would be quite different, so that would potentially affect the the proportion of um, different features within it. Um, as far as I could tell, for the the selection of images across the breeds, again, they looked to be more of adult examples than than juveniles. Um, so certainly, I think that that is relevant. Um, and also, it might be the case that. Um, Young individuals may be more expressive, um, certainly in species like cats, where um, in the wild as adults, they actually don't want to express any sort of uh, behavioural physiological compromise. So it could be actually younger individuals um, when they're in the nest and they're receiving care from their mother, it might be advantageous for them to be quite expressive in non-visual ways. And then the, the value of this um, expressiveness might drop as they, they leave the nest and they become more independent and asocial. So that would be really fantastic to, fantastic to look at as a you know, future areas of research to see um, how age impacts on, on, on expressiveness in that way. Um, also from, from just a, a senescence point of view, of course, so older animals are likely to, to more likely to suffer from chronic conditions um, relinked to, to their joints, for example. So again, it might be that when you're trying to get uh, non-painful examples from um, elder cats, they might actually always be in, in a to experiencing chronic pain to a, to a small degree, perhaps. So, so yeah, I, I think actually interestingly, age could impact on um, expressiveness in, of pain-related features in, in a range of different ways. Um, so we probably have time for one last question, which will be the last question of session one. Um, and the question is, uh, nice use of automated face characterization. Do we know whether conspecifics respond to pain faces in any non-human species? Um, I know that there's been quite a bit of work done in, in dogs. I don't think it's been done in relation to pain, but I know that they can discriminate between um, the expression of other uh, affective states or, or, or intents, um, certainly. Um, so I'm not 
not sure that that's actually been looked at in relation to pain, certainly not in, in cats. Um, perhaps in, in primate species, that, that might have been something that has been investigated, not that I'm aware of though, but, but certainly would be very interesting to, to know more about that. Well, so thank you very much. Um, that is the last presentation of uh, session one. So uh, sorry for some of the glitches and things uh, we had at the beginning. Hopefully they've been sorted out. Um, you've got a half an hour break before session two, which begins at 13.20. Um, some of you have said that you've got some problems accessing the posters too. Uh, there should have been a Dropbox link in the email that was sent to you. Um, to do with registering for the conference. And if you follow that, you certainly should be able to get to the post link, but we'll look to get that sorted too. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I hope you're looking forward to session two. Thank you. <laughs>